They're stranded in a foreign land. I was so scared, but they didn't believe me. But the UN refuses to help these refugees. I kept asking, I kept crying, but they did not listen to me. And then she saw the face of evil. He said, if you try to leave or if you try to take the kids, I'll kill you. Before being rescued by the hands of an angel. And it told me everything was gonna be okay. Plus, the woman Billy Graham calls the best preacher in the family. Anne Graham Lotz takes us through the Daniel Prayer on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. The Democrats and the Republicans are facing off and the election is going to be in November, but it seems like an eternity until then. But the Democrats are playing the same playbook they've used in the last two major elections. How do they do it? Before there is federal funding for their opponents during the hiatus period, <clears throat> the Democrats pound the daylights out of their opponent. They did it to Bob Dole, and they did it to Mitt Romney. And they begin to question their character, their abilities, their compassion, and all the rest of it. And it's subtle, and it's devastating. Then by the time <clears throat> the funding from the federal government comes down, and their opponent is able to pick up steam and begin to advertise, he or she is already dead in the polls. That's the game, and that's being played out once again. Same playbook, same deal that have, have, we've seen in two cycles, and for some reason the Republicans haven't caught on yet. I don't know why, but it's there so clearly. Well, after falling in the polls and trailing in the money uh, situation, Donald Trump is trying to get back on track for his campaign. He sacked his campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and his team is getting ready for a long battle, but he's way behind in fundraising, and he's certainly behind in the attack ads that have been filling the airwaves. Wendy. That's right. Trump, he's, he's <coughs> meeting with nearly a 1,000 Christian leaders behind closed doors. Caitlin Burke has that story. It's billed as a conversation with the candidate. Today, hundreds of Christian leaders meet with Donald Trump to ask questions and learn more about the presumptive Republican nominee. Regent University's Dr. Jerson Moreno-Riano says he thinks we'll Trump will try and unite the evangelical leaders behind some core issues. The whole question of dignity of life and pro-life issues, the question of same-sex marriage, uh, the, the liberty of conscience and freedom of uh, religion and uh, liberty principles, those are some of the things that I think are cutting across the wide evangelical spectrum. Meanwhile, only a day ahead of today's meetings with evangelicals, a major shakeup for the Trump campaign, with Trump firing his campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. The move comes among reports of disagreements and infighting among the staff. Now there's speculation that it was Donald Trump's most trusted advisors, his children, who wanted Lewandowski gone. I think it's fair, but I think, you know, in many respects, he was coming to that on his own. And, we, we, you know, we are there to help, you know, augment that and really, you know, think it through with him. Republican strategist Paul Manafort is taking over the campaign. As the Trump team tries to get back on track and he meets with evangelicals, the Wall Street Journal reports he's also set to announce a religious advisory board this week. The new group of 20 to 30 people will be among the religious leaders he meets with today. One of the people likely to be named to that board, Paula White, played a lead role in organizing today's meeting and the board itself. She told CBN News that Trump is looking for counsel from religious leaders. He has sought and he's asked for the wisdom of an executive council to be put around him that is faith-based, that represents so many different um, communities of us within Christianity and then to form an advisory board. And I'm really excited about that. Among other potential picks to the board, Jerry Falwell Jr., the president of Liberty University, and Ronnie Floyd, president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, we'll have a report tomorrow on that meeting. I apparently was part of the host committee, but I didn't go, and uh, I hope it's a success. Well, in other news, a young British man has been stopped after he allegedly tried to kill Donald Trump in Las Vegas. John Jessup has that story. That's right, Pat. A 19-year-old from the United Kingdom is accused of trying to kill Donald Trump at a rally in Las Vegas. 
police have charged Stephen Sanford with planning Trump's assassination for about a year. Reports indicate he had been living in the United States illegally after overstaying a visa. The Secret Service said Sanford stopped to tell a police officer he wanted an autograph from Trump and then tried to take the officer's gun. He was charged Monday with committing a violent act. Well, China has taken the lead in supercomputing, building by far the world's fastest supercomputer. China now has 167 of the top 500 in the world, two more than the United States' 165 supercomputers. Just 15 years ago, China did not have any on the list. The newest, fastest model runs completely on Chinese-designed supercomputers. Analysts say it shows just how far China has come and that the Asian giant could be threatening America's position as the world's leader in technology. Well, do unborn babies feel pain? That question is at the center of a controversy of a decades-old study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association. It examined whether and when an unborn child begins to feel pain, like the pain of being aborted. As Lori Johnson explains, there are serious concerns about the credibility of the study, which has been cited by the abortion industry. The Journal of the American Medical Association is refusing to retract a study about fetal pain. The article, published in 2005, concluded unborn babies do not feel pain before 29 weeks inside the mother's womb. The study has been touted by those who support late-term abortions. People taking issue with the study called for its retraction based on both ethical and scientific considerations. James Agresti, a public policy fact checker who requested the retraction, told CBN News the authors of the study failed to disclose they're directly linked to the abortion industry. The authors, if you read it, says no financial, uh, no financial disclosures. One of the authors was the medical director of the, an abortion clinic. Okay, two of the other authors, one served as an attorney for NARAL and another also worked in an abortion clinic. But JAMA said the information that we have indicates the authors complied with the journal conflict of interest requirements in 2005. Furthermore, Agresti refuted the study's main conclusion that a developed cerebral cortex is necessary to feel pain. But what science has clearly shown within two years of that paper being published, two medical journals, peer-reviewed medical journals, published papers saying that's absolute nonsense. You do not need your cerebral cortex to be conscious. And in fact, we know that for a fact because some, some children have a disorder where they're born without a cerebral cortex. And these, these children, absolutely, they're conscious, they smile, some things make them unhappy, make them cry. In fact, they're so normal that sometimes you don't even know they have the condition until months later when developmental milestones are missed. In response to the subsequent articles, JAMA said although they may add to the existing evidence on a topic or propose alternative theories, that new information does not require retraction of previous review articles. Although the medical community is not united on when an unborn child begins to feel pain, a large number of health professionals concur it's at 20 weeks gestation. That's why 12 states have passed the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act to protect unborn babies from painful abortions after 20 weeks. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Pat, 12 states and counting. Well, they call it the abortion distortion. There are just a scheme of lies that keep filling the airways. The, uh, I don't know what it is about this culture of death that we have here that just it delights in killing people, but that's the way it is. They want to kill babies. They want to put to death old people. I mean, it's the whole idea of death, and they seem to revel in it. And they seem to have no end to the deception that goes on in terms of covering up what they're doing. Uh, just to think that when they were selling body parts out of Planned Parent clinics, that, that they got a judge who wanted to uh, arrest the people who took the pictures to reveal what they were doing. I mean, it's this kind of thing going on. And uh, it's uh, why? It's a culture of death, and you, you have to look at the spiritual roots of some of this and say, well, the enemy of our soul is, is Satan, and he hates people. He hates human beings, and the idea that if humans can kill other humans, and the devil wants to do everything to help it. 
How many have we killed so far? How many babies? 50 million, 55, maybe 60 million. The numbers are so high, it's hard to keep up with. But it's a shocking holocaust. And uh, we as Americans seem to think it's okay. Well, it's not okay. And one day, a righteous, holy God is going to demand an accounting for every drop of blood that has been spilled of innocent, unborn babies. And we just keep in mind, when it happens, it's going to be awful. John? Mm -hmm. Pat, in health news, eating just a few more servings of plant-based foods like vegetables every day and cutting back on animal-based foods like meat and dairy could substantially cut your risk of type 2 diabetes. Those are the findings from extensive studies involving 200,000 men and women. The study's lead author says it doesn't take a major shift in eating habits. Just replacing one or two servings of animal-based foods with some vegetables can improve your chances for better health. Pat, arming moms and dads everywhere with yet another argument to get their kids to eat their veggies. Um, you know, a lot of kids like veggies if you give them to them. Good veggies are very tasty. You like and fruit. Well, my fruit. niece and nephew were visiting yeah. over the weekend, and my my niece loves fruit. I mean, she mm -hmm. she likes ice cream too, but she loves strawberries and oranges and watermelon and cantaloupe. A lot of kids don't yeah, like yeah. cantaloupe, so you know it was re really refreshing to well, see that. Man. Well, they they also like they like carrots and they like peas and they like broccoli. They all these things if if you just give them to them early enough, but. <clears throat> we're we're I mean we're in a in a McDonald's type of uh, environment where eating hamburgers is the American way. Yeah, if you get hungry enough, it'll taste <laughs> yeah. really good. Well, well, I like vegetables. I like beans, <laughs> particularly. All right. Well, up next, Christians who fled persecution in Pakistan and then found out that their new home was even worse. My life is so terrible right now. Now I'm here, and my wife is dead. What am I supposed to do? So why isn't anyone helping these refugees? You'll hear their stories when we return. You know, I've been to Pakistan a couple of times. I've been to Quetta uh, up on the border of uh, Afghanistan. I've. Uh, sat with the Mujahideen and talked about their strategies during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, I have seen some very, very lovely people who were educated in Christian uh, missionary schools or British schools. Uh, the military was shaped after the British model. Pakistan is a very nice country, but Apparently, it has been taken over by the most radical of the Islamic people. And uh, now, instead of being a benign friend of the United States, which takes billions of our dollars, it's become one of the most dangerous countries in the world, especially for Christians. The persecution there is so severe that record numbers of people have been getting out of Pakistan. And one place they're going is Thailand. But as George Thomas uncovered in, our, uh, in Bangkok, life for them is anything but easy. With his voice quivering and tears filling his eyes, Mustak Faisal said he had no choice but to leave Pakistan. My life is full of challenges. Muslim neighbors accused the young Christian of tearing pages from the Quran, so they wanted his family killed. I was so scared. I told them I would never do anything like that to their holy book, but they didn't believe me. Fearing for their lives, Faisal took his wife Samina, son Joshua, and fled to Thailand with hopes of starting a new life free from Islamic death threats. The moment we arrived in Thailand, I submitted our asylum application with the UN. But six months after arriving in country, Faisal still had not heard back from the UN's agency responsible for protecting refugees. And with the family's three-month tourist visa expired, the Thai government sent immigration police after them. I was not at home when the Thai police came to our apartment. My wife told them she was a heart patient and that they should not arrest her, but they didn't listen. Under Thai law, any refugee who overstays their tourist visa is illegally in country. 
The arrested, like Samina, are taken in caged vans to an immigration detention center, or IDC. She was okay for the first three days, but then she got very ill on December 20th. Faisal pleaded with the UN to help his sick wife. I kept asking, I kept crying, but they did not listen to me. He begged detention guards to give her heart medications. I told him that if you don't do anything, she will die. The name Jesus Christ. Wilson Chowdhury, a Christian human rights advocate, tried to intervene but wasn't too hopeful based on past experience. And what we found is that uh, the wardens protecting, meant to be protecting these detainees, deny them access to health care and medicines. His group and others obtained images showing inhumane conditions inside the IDC facility, including of men chained like dogs. The stench as you walk in is overpowering. Um, the toilets, are, uh, uh, there are two toilets to serve over 200 people. And in some cases, 200 people crammed in rooms that barely fit 100. So they're sleeping one on top of each other, or they'll be sleeping crouching or standing up. On December 30th, 2015, the UN finally responded to Faisal, but with news that his wife Samina had died. My life is so terrible right now. We face so many difficulties in Pakistan, and that's why we escaped to Thailand. Now I'm here, and my wife is dead. What am I supposed to do? My son keeps asking, where is mommy? But I don't have the courage to tell him the truth. Six other Pakistani Christian refugees have died in Thai detention centers. More than 100,000 Pakistanis have fled their homeland because of rising Islamic violence. Reports say nearly 11,000 are in Thailand, many of them Christians. The problem is the government here doesn't want any refugees from anywhere. And since Thailand is not a signatory to a UN agreement on asylum seekers, folks like George Naz face a precarious future. We were treated as second-class citizens in Pakistan. Now we come here and we face similar conditions. Naz is a wanted man in Pakistan. In 2013, he was accused of blasphemy by an Islamic court, but escaped to Thailand. For now, he hides and waits an illegal, with no right to work, no access to schools or hospitals. I'm scared to go outside my building because the immigration police or army can arrest me at any moment. CBN News visited a housing complex in Bangkok where scores of Pakistani Christian families are crammed into small apartments, many living illegally. For example, we live in one room with four other families. Our kids cannot go to school because they are also considered illegal. So the whole day, we just sit at home. For a few hours on Sunday morning, a handful of Pakistani Christian families brave arrest <laughs> to attend the secret church service. Stranded in Thailand for years, many here hope and pray for designated UN refugee status and eventually the chance to settle in a third country. In the meantime, a few Christian NGOs are helping them and others with food and living expenses. But the needs are overwhelming. For now, though, Faisal clings to the one thing he knows will bring comfort. He reads verses from Psalm 121, reminding his son Joshua that it is God who will take care of all their needs. I trust in God. Only God can help us in our time of difficulties. George Thomas, CBN News, Bangkok, Thailand. All over the world, there's a flood of refugees. There's so much turmoil, turmoil in the Middle East, turmoil in uh, Asia, turmoil in uh, South America. <laughs> People, are, their lives are threatened. They, they don't have sufficient livelihood. They, they're starving, many of them. And, uh, you know, we are taking millions of refugees into America, and many of them are Islamic. Many of them are terrorists. They have problems. Others are just people who are looking for a better life. 
but nevertheless, uh, we're being called upon to be very humanitarian, and so we open our doors to them and we look after them. Uh, Europe had done the same thing, and now the Europeans, the Germans, to say we can't stand anymore this. Our economy won't take it. And here, Thailand, supposedly an enlightened country in the Far East, there's no refugees, period. You didn't know about that, did you? And you see this, the appalling, appalling conditions that these refugees have to live in. So it's, it's what do we do? The whole world is, is, is convulsed uh, with the upheaval that's taking place. And a good percentage of it is caused by radical Islam because that's what's causing the problem in Pakistan. Radical Islamists are trying to kill those who don't agree with them. Same thing is true in the Middle East. War in Syria, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, all the way through, and upheaval after upheaval being caused by radical Islamic uh, people. That is the root cause of a good portion of this. Not all of it, of course, but a great deal of it. And the suffering is beyond belief. And so we pray for them. We do everything we do to help them. And the UN bodies should do something to deal with the situation. And they obviously aren't because they don't know what the solution is. Mm. Well, Wendy, you've got a story of uh, <laughs> closer to home. Yes. Well, coming up, she thought she married Prince Charming. Instead, she married the Prince of Darkness. He punched his fist right through the wall past my head. I remember standing in the kitchen and feeling like I was looking at pure evil. One tormented spouse makes her escape right after this. Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. We're glad to have you with us today. I've got a tremendous program a story for you today. A lady who thought that she had married Prince Charming, Susan Call, but she lived in fear. What fear? Fear of the man who slept next to her. Her husband was abusive and unfaithful. And one day, Susan was able to pack up her family and go. And here's how a series of miracles helped make it happen. He came into the kitchen and said, we need to talk. He went on to say that he had been having an affair with a woman who had previously been a nanny. He said, if you try to leave or if you try to take the kids, I'll kill you. I remember standing in the kitchen and feeling like I was looking at pure evil. Susan Call no longer recognized the man she met in college, who she thought was her Prince Charming. I met my first husband, I'll call Joe, and he was quick with compliments. When I met him, I was just sort of swept away by his charisma. But shortly after the two married, he became jealous and started watching her every move. He really kept close reins on where I was, who I was with. If the phone rang, um, he wanted to answer it so that he knew was who was on the other end. Susan and Joe had two children. Joe eventually began drinking heavily and became verbally abusive. He would regularly tell me that I was useless, that I was an awful mother to regularly break me down or to make me doubt myself or to feel as though no one else would care about me. Susan and Joe fought constantly. We had one argument one day where he punched his fist right through the wall past my head. Um, as long as there was um, substance abuse in our house, as long as there were um, temperamental outbursts, uh, I knew that my children and I weren't safe. Joe revealed his affair with the nanny and threatened Susan's life. That was the point at which I knew I could not put the marriage back together myself. Divorce was something that I didn't go into marriage wanting. She later met with a lawyer who specialized in abuse cases. He said 90% of the cases um, is hot air. It's not, you're really not in any danger. And he just said, I'm so sorry. You're in the 10%. Susan often used her drive to work to ponder her situation. One day, one of her favorite stations changed formats. It had been purchased by Christian Broadcasting. And I remember thinking, who are these people? They, they took my radio station. How could they do that? I began listening out of curiosity. Susan had been raised going to church, and the music and teaching on the station took her back to her childhood. The stories that the people shared were nothing like mine. 
they had been through illnesses or uh, maybe they too had been through infidelity, all kinds of trauma in their families. But what I was taken back by is there was a common thread through all of them, and it was hope. And I decided I really wanted that hope. Meanwhile, the strife at home continued. And I remember standing there saying, God, if you're real, you need to show up. And it wasn't long after praying that, that um, I was on the way home from a doctor's appointment with my son, and we were in a head-on car accident. Remarkably, I was uninjured. My son had not a single scratch. And he says, Mommy, I saw an angel. And then it was inside of the window of the van, and it told me everything was gonna be okay. And that propelled me to go to church the next Sunday. Susan went by herself that week and was moved by the message and music. They begin singing Amazing Grace. And as they sang the words, I wept. And it, it changed me. And, and that, it was at that point that I understood my faith in a way that I had never understood before. And I understood that it was a, a relationship, that I could talk to God, I could cry out to God, and He heard me. And he answered, it's the peace that passes all understanding. With her newfound faith to help guide her, Susan prayed for wisdom about her next step. It took me six months of planning, um, six months of tucking money away, tucking some clothes away, um, an emergency bag in case we needed to run quickly. She also met with a team of volunteers who helped domestic abuse victims. One morning when Joe went out of town, they arrived and loaded her and her children in a moving van she drove to a location 14 hours away. The morning we fled, I kept thinking we're gonna get caught. This isn't gonna work. Um, I'm not gonna be safe. Um, and as much as fear tried to fill me, I kept trying to, just taking one step after the next. That morning, a neighbor saw her packing the van to leave. The entire time she watched, she was calling Jill on her phone. And she wanted to tell him that we were leaving because she assumed that he was the victim. Interestingly enough, her phone calls didn't go through. And I have no doubt that was one of the many ways God provided for us. As she watched her children that morning, Susan says God spoke to her. And as I'm watching their anticipation and their hunger for what lies ahead, I felt like God say to me, what are you looking at? Are you looking at your brokenness? Are you looking at the infidelity? Are you looking at all the things that could have been but won't be? Are you looking at the possibility that your future isn't safe or isn't possible? Because I'm the God of the impossible. And in that moment, I realized that it's so easy to look in the rear view of life at all the things we've been through, rather than look ahead to the possibilities when we trust God. Susan waited several months, but eventually returned for custody hearings. Her husband was allowed supervised visits, and Susan later found it in her heart to forgive him. I realized that if I didn't forgive him, that I was saying that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough for Joe's sins. And the remarkable thing is that as I forgave, it was me who received the benefit. Susan later remarried, and today she speaks to women on faith and domestic abuse. My purpose really is to share my story and encourage others. The number of times that I've um, reflected back over the answered prayers that I've had have really helped me to learn to trust God. I realize that I can't limit Him by what I think is possible, and I've learned to not be afraid to pray the really big prayers, um, the prayers that I have no idea how they could happen. God gave me a lifetime supply of hope. A lifetime supply of hope, and that's what she had, and that's what you can have. You know, some of you watching this program, you're trapped in domestic abuse. You have an abusive spouse. It doesn't always have to be the man. It can be the woman as well who are abusing, sometimes physical abuse, sometimes mental abuse, but trapped in a marriage instead of being heaven on earth, which it should be, it can become hell on earth. And there is a way out. The way, first way, of course, is to know Jesus. And then to have Jesus, the great shepherd, lead you out to safety. And he'll do it.
Unfortunately, they're organizations that help batter and abuse women, and uh, they're there to help you. But I tell you right now, uh, if you want to know to be free, you need to first start with the Lord. And I want you to pray with me now and pray these words. You do it with me if you would. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that you died for me, and I thank you that you love me, and I thank that you are a fountain of hope. And so I put my trust in you, and I commit to you the problems that I have been faced with. You know how severe they are. You know what's going on in my life. And I ask you, Lord, set me free. In your holy name I ask it. Amen and amen. Well, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to give us a call. If you want further help, to somebody here who can help you, telephone number is 1-800-759-0700. So call in right now. Somebody's here who cares about you. Wendy? Thanks, Pat. Still ahead, the one prayer that changes everything, that's according to Anne Graham Lott. Find out what it is and how it can work for you when we come back. She's here. And welcome back to the 700 Club. As expected, all four gun control bills failed to pass the Senate Monday. Both parties presented measures to keep suspected terrorists from getting guns. Senate Democrat Dianne Feinstein says the Orlando terrorist attack proves there's a need for action. The Orlando attack again exposed a dangerous loophole in our law that allows known or suspected terrorists to legally purchase guns. One plan from Democrats included a broader ban on gun sales to suspects, while Republicans called for a delay on those sales until a judge could examine each case. A Harvard professor who unveiled a small fragment of papyrus claiming it proved Jesus was married is now saying she made a mistake and the fragment was forged. Back in 2012, Harvard Divinity professor Karen King presented the fragment which includes the phrase, Jesus said to them, my wife. In a recent interview with the Associated Press, she admitted her previous assumptions were not correct, citing an article published on the Atlantic Magazine's website last week. King says she was lied to by the owner of the fragment. A professor of religious studies at Duke University told CBN News, scholars were so excited about what the fragment said about Jesus' wife, they didn't investigate whether it was real. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, it's cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. All right, believers, it's time for us to storm the gates of heaven. If you've ever felt as if your prayers aren't being heard or you feel surrounded by chaos, then it's time you try the Daniel prayer. Ann Graham Lotz explains. Ann Graham Lotz has been proclaiming God's word around the world for 30 years. She's been called the best preacher in the family by her beloved father, Billy Graham, who has preached to more people than anyone in history. Like her dad, Anne is also a best-selling author. And her signature events called Just Give Me Jesus have been held in more than 30 cities and 12 countries, drawing hundreds of thousands of attendees. In her book, The Daniel Prayer, Anne outlines the prayer of the biblical prophet Daniel and teaches you how to pray effectively for yourself, your family, and this nation. Well, if ever there was a time for a book like that, it is now, and we are pr privileged to have Anne Graham Lotz with us right here in the studio. Anne, it's good to see you again. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Well, we have got to ask about your dad. Oh. He's turning 98 this year. Is that right? That's right. He'll be 98 in November. And I know and he just uh, wrote a book not too long ago. Well, and um, <laughs> another book, right? How's he doing? Was written, he's, he's doing good. He's 97. He's uh, confined to his bed or wheelchair. He's not mobile, oh. but he has a good appetite. And um, I talked to him on Father's Day, and okay. it was so sweet. He, he has a hard time hearing my voice, but he heard me on the 
the phone, told me that he loved me, had just been talking about me. So, uh, you know, it's a blessing. I don't get up to see him as often as I would like, yeah. but um, I'm not sure if I went every day if it would be often enough. You know, oh, but, right. So I just encourage people when they think about Billy Graham to pray, pray that God him. will keep him. I know God's holding him for a purpose. Yes. And uh, I don't know what the purpose is. I can guess, you know, but only God really knows. But yeah. that's. Um, but that he'll hold him and he'll be faithful until that moment when God takes him home. Yeah, so. well, good to hear he's doing well. We love him. Yeah, thank you. Well, you've just written an amazing new book called The Daniel Prayer. First of all, what is The Daniel Prayer? Well, The Daniel Prayer is based on Daniel chapter nine. It was the prayer that he prayed for his people when they were separated from God. They had left their foundation of faith and they were being held captive by the enemy. Mm -hmm. And he prayed a prayer based on God's word. He came across a promise in Jeremiah that said that after 70 years, God said, I will set your people free. I'll return them back to their homeland if you would seek me with all of your heart. And so Daniel reads that promise and he uh, connects the dots with the problems that he saw his people facing. And he just, it's what Eugene Peterson calls reverse thunder. He prayed God's word back to him. Right. And so the Daniel prayer is a prayer of desperation. It's a prayer, um, no holds barred prayer. It's right. not like a now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer. <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a prayer that you turn to God away from everything yes. else and you just. When God is the only hope, when That's he's right. the only solution. Right. Well, Daniel's prayer, as you said, was on behalf of the nation of Judah, which was under God's judgment at That's the time. Right. But you say, Anne, that there are parallels today with ancient Judah and modern day America, how so? Well, in the end of Second Chronicles, God sent messenger after messenger to warn Judah that she would come under his judgment if she didn't repent of her sin. Right. She became more defiant, more rebellious. In the end, the Bible says God turned against his own people. He turned against Judah and sent in Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It was a 22 year period of um, judgment from the first time Nebuchadnezzar attacked until the time that Jerusalem was actually destroyed. But Daniel was taken off the first time Nebuchadnezzar attacked. And, and the parallel is that God, he never sneaks up and judges a person or a nation by surprise. He always warns in advance. Yeah. And I believe God has been warning America like he warned Judah and America has turned a deaf ear for the most part. Now, there, there are people in America that have heard, but I think generally speaking, our nation is morally and spiritually imploding. We are, and, and my concern is that we would point, we would pass the point of no return. Yeah. Because there comes a time when the psalmist said, you know, you cry unto the Lord, you pray while he may be found, implying there's a time when God can't be found because he turns away. Our sin is so come between us and him, he won't listen to us anymore. And so my, my prayer, I don't believe it's too late now because God is stirring so many people to pray. Yeah. And it's time now to pray like Daniel did before it's too late, or we're going to wish that we had. God is the only hope for America, and it's time that God's people cried out to him. Well, even in Daniel's time, it looked like it was past hope. That's it looked right. like there was no hope, but he kept praying. That's and, right. and like you said, he saw yeah. really a miracle yeah. Yeah. happen, yeah. something that there was no way that should have happened yeah. that Cyrus That's right. said, you, you can go back. Yes, that, it was just out of the yeah. blue. It was, so Daniel prayed in the 67th year and he prayed that God would keep his word. Yeah. And three years later, God kept his word, the 70th year, uh, Cyrus out of no, you know, just out, out of the blue, as you said, for no other reason except that Daniel had prayed. He let the people go. He issued an edict yeah. and said, you can all go back. And um, so I believe that in our, Daniel's God is our God. Right. He is a prayer hearing, a prayer answering, a miracle working covenant keeping God, but he waits for us to come to him. He, and he, he's commanding us, I believe, to repent of our sin, speaking first of all to the church. You know, we point our finger at our society and I think we, you know, our society has a lot of sin. Sinners sin, that's what they do. And our right. society is getting very good at it. But God's people, you know, we, we need to first examine our own hearts. We need to repent of our sin. And that's what Chronicle says that if my people right. who are called by, and, that's, and to pray that back to God, God, you said, if my people who are called by my name would humble, my, humble ourselves, pray, seek your face, if we would turn from our wicked ways, right. then you said you will hear and you'll forgive and you'll heal our land. So the Daniel prayer isn't just a prayer for the nations, right? No, it can be your own prayer. It can be like if you have a child who's in rebellion or a spouse that walks out or bankruptcy in your business or a health diagnosis that you weren't expecting. It's a prayer of desperation. And it's just, a, it's not a liturgy. It's a pattern to his prayer that works. Heaven was moved before he finished praying. God sent an angel to him to tell him, you're highly esteemed, mm -hmm. Daniel. You know, and I love the fact that yes. a person that prays like Daniel did is highly esteemed in heaven. And then three years later, the prayer was answered specifically. And Anne, you, you turned to the Daniel prayer last year. Tragedy struck in your own life. Mm -hmm. uh, very personal tragedy. What happened? Well, um, 
you know, I've been married 49 years at that point, That's and amazing. my husband was in um, not good health. I'd been his full-time caregiver for three years, just gotten mm -hmm. off the road, stayed home, and I think that's when God got my attention that this was a time to pray, not a time to travel and speak, but just to pray and take care of my husband. And then on August 17th last year, I found him unresponsive in our pool. And two days later, we put him on life support. Two days later, um, we removed him and, and he went, moved our father's house. And yeah. so when I miss him, like this Father's Day was oh. hard, but um, yeah. I miss him. I, I remember his bad health and all of his issues. And I'm so thankful, Wendy, that God has set him free. Yes. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that even though we die, when we believe, we will, we live. And so my husband, I believe today, is more alive than he's ever been. Wow. And one day I'll see him again in his flesh, and I'll be in my flesh, and you know we'll be reunited in heaven. So I have that hope to look forward to. You um, were married 49 years. I buried him two days short of our 49th wedding anniversary. This year would have been our 50th. 49 and, uh, years yeah. with, with the man that you loved. That's, I, that I met him when rich. I was 17, so he was the center of my yeah. life, all of my life, that just about. Amazing. But um, But God, you know, can I just, anybody out there who's struggling yeah. with something like this, can I just tell you that um, one of the ways that I've gotten through this, not only is the, the prayer, of course, but focusing on the blessings of God. Instead of focusing on the pain and the grief and the turmoil and the, you know, uh, all that goes with exactly. something like that, you focus on the blessings. And God has poured out His blessings on me. And, and it makes me very grateful. And, and yes, there are tears. Yes, there are moments. But there's a lot of joy and thanksgiving because our God is God. And He is faithful to us, yes. just as He was faithful to Daniel. And, and God will be faithful to your viewers, faithful to you. And the reason I know that is because God is faithful. He can't be less than Himself. He is a faithful God. He's faithful to keep His promises, faithful to keep His warnings and yeah. faithful to answer our prayers, but we need to cry out to Him. He doesn't answer prayers unless we ask. Unless we so ask. it's time for us to pray. Right, mm -hmm. and um, so many people are saying that this book is changing their mm -hmm. lives. I mean, strong Christians yeah. saying this book is life-changing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for writing and yeah. for your constant inspiration. And you can get more in Anne's book. It's called The Daniel Prayer, and it's available in stores nationwide. And God bless you. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks so much Thank for being you. with Thank us. Thank you. Still to come, a Q&A session with Pat you don't want to miss, starting with this one. Iris says, my husband is not a Christian. He prays to other gods and he gets offended when I bring it up. What should I do? Bring it on is right around the corner. Don't go away. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Well, thank you for being with us. You're watching The 700 Club, and we've got a lot more coming. Just south of the Sahara Desert, there's a thriving garden. While that may sound uh, impossible, that is exactly what you'll find at one church. Thanks to health from a man, uh, 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 an Israeli company and a partnership with CBN. Years ago, a new church was born in the Muslim village of Falar in Senegal, West Africa. And it was started because of a revival among the children. Jesus was alive in these children. They had the gift of the Holy Spirit. They prayed for the sick and they were healed. But the church and the village struggled because they didn't have enough water for drinking or for crops. This semi-arid region has a two-month growing season. The rest of the year is hot and dry with no rainfall. That's when CBN offered to drill a well for the people of our village. But this wasn't just any well. It is a deep water well with an underground pump that can deliver up to a thousand gallons of water an hour. The pump is powered by solar panels and quickly refills this storage tank. This well is like a precious gem for the village because the water is so pure. Today, everyone comes and gets clean water. Then to help the church prosper, we added Israeli drip irrigation and a monitoring system on their property. Plants receive just the right amount of water to grow. The system was made possible through our partnership with Israel's Innovation Africa and the U.S.-based Alliance for Global Good. The crops grew so well in that first season 
that the church was able to hire its members to gather the harvest. And with the profits from the sale of the produce, they were able to buy a second field. All of this is helping the church to grow. I thank all the partners, especially CBN and Innovation Africa. I thank all those who give money for this work. You're doing that. You say, I didn't know I was doing a drip irrigation project in the Sahara. Yes, you are. <laughs> and many other things like that, because we care about people, suffering people all around the world. And uh, that's just one example of something that CBN is doing. We have drilled thousands of water wells around the world. We have treated hundreds of thousands of sick people. We have fed millions of people who were hungry. And you can do it if we all join together. And we ask you to join the seminar club. And I have in my hand something called Victory Over Life's Storms. And uh, this is a DVD that will tell you how to overcome the storms that have hit you in life. And it's available to you as you join the 700 Club. But I think now is time to get into some questions. We got some good ones. All right, Iris writes in, I've been saved for three years now. My husband has not been open to Christianity yet. He prays to other gods like St. Michael, Buddha, and Nino Jesus. My husband gets offended when I talk about him, about praying to them. What can I do? Oh, you know, the Bible says that without a word, a godly woman can, uh, you know, lead her husband to faith by not saying anything, just the way she lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the answer. Live your life with the Lord. Show the radiant joy of the Lord in your life. And hopefully your husband will get free of the delusion that he's engaged in. But uh, he'll begin to say, how come you are so happy in the midst of the troubles we're having? And you say, well, I, it's because I have Jesus. And that's what you do. Okay. Amen. Danielle says, dear Pat, I was wondering if it's good to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior every time I pray, even though I accepted him already. I love him and appreciate everything he did for me and many others from around the world by dying on the cross. I am saved. The question is, uh, you get married, and would you like to get married uh, because you love your wife, and then uh, she's good to you, and so you decide, let's get married again, and then uh, you have a nice meal, and you want to get married again, and then, <laughs> you know, you, you have a pleasant evening, you want to get married again. Uh, you, you're married, so stay married, be happy at it, and get on with your life. And I think it's the same thing with the Lord. You don't keep getting saved. You've given your heart to the Lord. He is yours, you're His, and you're born again. So enter into that relationship. Okay. Amen. Well, it might be fun to put that wedding dress on again, you know, yeah, well, if it still fits. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> Just make sure it fits. <laughs> All right. Well, Josh writes in, I'm a reborn Christian. I gave my life to Christ back in February. And since then, I have felt convicted to drop habits and cut away from a sinful nature. I have stopped all habits. I used to smoke, and then I moved to a vapor containing nicotine to get off tobacco. Am I sinning every time I use a vapor? I, will I be punished if I continue well, to use nicotine? God doesn't sit up in heaven waiting to punish people because you smoke a cigarette or, or you, you look at a pornographic magazine or something. I mean, God is God, and He loves you, and He wants you to be part of His life, and He wants to share His life with you. And um, what you have done is, is clean your act up and, and you say, I want to present myself wholly to the Lord. So uh, you've got a vapor machine. You know, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So if you feel it's wrong, then it's wrong. If you don't feel it's wrong, it's not wrong. I, I mean, it's one of those things. But you're not going to lose heaven because you've got a vapor machine in lieu of cigarettes. It just it doesn't work that way. God loves you and He wants you to be part of His kingdom. At least he's trying to get off nicotine. It's he's trying. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, you, you, you're working at it, but I mean, that's not the key. The key is you love him. You love him, Amen. John. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. That's what he wants is our love. Love covers a multitude of sins. You got it. Okay. Michelle says, my parents don't let me watch anything that they consider of this world. Sometimes I sneak and watch a show that I really like. I don't think anything is wrong with the show, but it is wrong to, is it wrong to disobey, disobey my parents? I think this rule is a bit over the top. 
Uh, look, I think it's a little over the top, too, but uh, the best thing to do is to obey your parents. You know, the problem is, uh, uh, in the ancient uh, Talmudic tradition, they said, all right, here is the law, okay? Now, somebody might break the law, so let's build a fence around the law out right here. Mm -hmm. So if they, they'll have to break the fence before they get in to break the law. Then we'll build another fence around the fence, and before long, there are so many rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing you know, somebody breaks one of these, they think they've sinned against God, and they've lost their access to the Lord. That's what this terrible legalism will do. It's love. Love isn't a series of rules. It's a love affair with God. It's just like with marriage. It's a love affair that is involved, not a set of regulations. And people need to understand that it, it, apparently the churches are teaching regulations. God isn't interested in regulations. He's interested in you and He together as one. Okay. Guess what? That was it. <laughs> what happened to the time? Well, you did so great that oh. we uh, were going to stop oh, right here. So sweet. It was while nice we're to ahead. be with you. And thank you again <laughs> for all of you being with us. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 91. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, thanks so much for being with us, for Wendy and all of us. Uh, we'll be looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow on another edition of the 700 Club. And a look at the San Bernardino, San Bernardino problem and uh, an inside perhaps you haven't heard before. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.